Welcome to the 144th episode of the Supernatural Occurrence Studies Podcast. So somewhat paranormal. My name is Jason Knight, host of the show. And with me, as always, is... Oh, it's Oscar Spector. Producer extraordinaire and podcast co-host. Oscar, before we begin tonight's topic, I I do want to mention... uh, our, our hearts and our, our thoughts and prayers are with Louisiana this evening. Hurricane Ida is, is just battering Louisiana, places like Grand Isle, New Orleans, Metairie, Mandeville, St. John's Parish, uh, countless other parishes, some of which I can't even pronounce. But, you know, uh, New Orleans is near and dear to my heart. And uh, this bitch Ida is just ravishing Louisiana. Yeah, it's, it's your it's your it's your second home, right? It really is. It really is. I'm a New Orleanian, I guess, at heart. And what's crazy now? It's it's really faux pas to compare hurricanes against one another mm-hmm. or to one another. But uh, 16 years ago today is when Hurricane Katrina made landfall. Yes, and that was as a big a, deal. Yeah, as a Category Three, and Ida hit. As a category four, there's uh, emergency workers been in the business 40 years saying they have never seen something like this. And they live through Katrina, right? Right. So it's just I've been riveted uh, watching it all day, all day long on every screen in the house. Uh, so I just, you know, just want to say that I'm there with you in spirit. The Supernatural Current Studies podcast is there with you in spirit. And, uh, we know you'll bounce back. Strong town, strong people. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, for sure. The other thing is, uh, if you want to skip our wonderful intro, please go to the show notes. There will be a timestamp there waiting for you to get you to the topic. Yeah. All right, Oscar, what has been going on? Thank you for handling episode 143. I loved your intro. Thank you. You know, uh, solo casting is... Um, it's a different breed, breed of uh, difficulty. So I was flexing muscles that I'm not used to. That was like the fifth take at least. And I had to <laughs> cut in and splice the, the better parts of other takes to make it all fit. I mean, it sounded seamless. It did sound good. But I'm saying like it wasn't one take. That wasn't in one sitting. I you, couldn't even tell. Because I was like, I'm like, am I saying that? And I realized I'm rambling sometimes. Like, yeah, you know, because Jay's not here. I'm not saying he doesn't want it. Like, I'm explaining, like, why am I saying it like that? Because I'm talking <laughs> to myself like a weirdo. <laughs> that, that must and be. Really, I've never done it. So it's got to be. So, weird. yeah, it's, it was weird. And in general, I'm a weirdo, especially when I'm by myself. So it didn't help matters. <laughs> like, I talk to myself all the time. So, um, yeah. So that was a little rough. But no, it came out good. I'm glad you all liked it. Um, I assume if you're listening to this, then you survived the last episode. That's right. They came back for more. So you did something right. 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 (laughs) But yeah, I was, I was out traveling. I took the family on a vacation. Uh, Mm -hmm. We were in Florida in New Smyrna beach for the week. And uh, uh, I just couldn't research and get a topic together. So I appreciate you doing that. I hope our listeners liked the Patreon sneak peek hotel Cecil. Uh, If you want to hear more, Things you will not hear on this public feed, uh, including video casts. Join our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash supernatural occurrence studies podcast, or just go to this episode show notes, click on the Patreon link. It'll get you right to us. We have a library of audio and video content there just waiting for you. Uh, so support your favorite show. Yeah, totally. Um, what else have you been up to? Nothing after, you know, coming home from vacation, vacation was fantastic. Like I said, but the problem is you got to come back to reality. And, you know, now that I have this new position at work, 
I came back to just a mess uh, of playing catch up. So I'm not going to say I regretted the vacation. I most certainly did not regret the vacation, but I got to figure out a plan because we're going again in December. Uh, it, it was really hard to come back to work because I was just completely overwhelmed. Did you get, uh, did you give yourself that extra buffer day? I did. Good. I did. did. I took do, a day did off. Did it wonders? Medication. Did it work? It I don't did. know if it wonders, but like, you know. Uh, yeah, I was, you know, able to unpack, clean up, do what we need to do, right. uh, answer some emails for work, kind of make sure the cat's okay. Right. Make sure the cat's alive, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I did take a vacation from the vacation. Very, very important. Mm-hmm. Take a vacation from your vacation. Buffer days, bro. They're important. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the guy who wonderful. barely goes on vacation, by the way. <laughs> we got to get you on more vacations, more podcast vacations, maybe. Yeah, yeah those are work. They're not vacations. <laughs> they're, wrong. they're fun. This show is fun, but it's work. Okay, that's not vacation. <laughs> I want to do right. nothing on a beach, not like read something for a research paper or something on a beach, you know. So, but well, I, understand. I understand. Speaking of research paper. Uh, oh, just, right, right. I got to say this here. You were telling me offline. <clears throat> uh, after this topic that we're going to get into tonight, your topic. <laughs> yes, uh, this is all me. <laughs> you might have a hundred plus page script, Oscar Spector. Yeah. <laughs> You can see the look on his face. Are you burnt out? Yes. I was burnt out before I wrote even one word of the script. Yeah, yeah this, how much is, this has been. Just this trying is to wrap my head around how it's going to come out. I need to find a fucking linear. Is, is anything linear? I need to find a way to write this. Um, but I did find a way. I spent this week up until very late last night finishing it. Um, part one only, by the way. But uh, don't worry, part two is looking to be a little bit more difficult, but it's, I'm coming on better shape already because I have a lot more. I can use this as a way to springboard from to part two. Um, I'll explain all that later. But yeah, it's been, a, it's been a trial for sure. It's been fun. Wow. Well, I can't wait to get into it. I'm thoroughly intrigued by the topic you chose in the roads it goes down. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, some, I, I was some... trying to tease you earlier uh, off air. About it, and I'm I'm gonna be. Te- this is a gigantic tease. I'm sorry in advance. This is a a gigantic tease. There's so much I won't tell you yet uh, on this first episode. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, besides all this, uh, what I've been up to is that um, nothing much necessarily. I have uh, I got myself a little blink camera, and I'm videotaping my my sugar gliders in their cage, like a bird's eye view, looking down. And so, it's the latest model, as far as I can tell, of one of them. And um, and so you can talk like, like a baby monitor. You can talk through it, you know, even if you're like miles away. And I did that. You, can, you I check it periodically. I have it censored to motion sensors. So when they wake up and move around, it lets me know. And it records for like two, I don't remember the time, like three minutes. And it's been fun watching what they do when I'm not around, you know, when I'm at work or whatever. And... I have to say, Zelda, the youngest one, youngest by two months, by the way, um, she, I, the first day I put the camera on her, and for most days after that, I noticed that she loves that wheel that I put in there. Loves it so much that every time I would check it periodically, like every two hours at work, I would just go on and, oh, I'm going to look, look what they're doing. Um, she was still on the wheel after like six hours sometimes. I'm like, what the hell is she doing? And like, no wonder she's so not interested in doing anything when I get home. <laughs> she's, she's tired, like, man. She's fucking tired. <laughs> she's, like, she's making that wheel her bitch. And it's it's fun. And it's funny. Every time I'm looking, I'm like, she better not be on the wheel. She better not be on the, you know. And I'm like, give Lily a chance to play on the wheel, girl. But, um, but no, either Lily doesn't want to or she doesn't get a chance to play. That is ridiculously cute. It is very cute. And they obviously licked the camera for, you know, once or twice because they're like, ooh, new thing and stuff. It's been, a, it's been, a, it's just a cute thing that I'm into. I've been into lately. Um, <laughs> besides that, um, you know, not a, not a whole lot. I had something in my brain a minute ago, but I forgot. Oh, yeah, you know, there is something. Um, not, uh, it's, it's weird. And it's almost like a question for our audience, but I know we haven't gotten a lot of feedback from them. But like maybe it's cool. maybe this could work. I've been thinking about, and what do you think of this? I've been thinking about um, doing, uh, trying to do our shows in a smaller, condensed version, and putting them on TikTok. 
I know nothing about TikTok. I, I didn't. I, that, I missed that train, I guess. But I mean, it's still on. But yeah, I know it's insanely popular. Obviously, you're always sending me cool, creepy TikToks and stuff. And right. And some of them, you know, you never know if they're real or not. Obviously, I'm not saying that everything I send you is 100 percent real, but some of them are. Yeah. I mean, with with a with a, an episode that's a hundred page script, I don't know how we would do it, you know. But right, hey, but no, no, I'm not. Maybe not this one. Maybe don't start with this one. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> go go simpler, right? Um, I think that'd be a good way, not only to promote and stuff, but like to like um, have like an alternate version to get people in on in on what we do here, uh, because everything, all these mediums are different flavors for different people and how they want their information or entertainment delivered and that's what we do essentially we uh, we do give information we do give all the stuff but like we're really entertainment device really um and i think that could be kind of fun you know i've been sort of researching it obviously i'm not saying you're gonna do it i'm just saying what do you think of the idea of it i mean that's something i might any do. i'm i'm down i don't know how to do it but i'm i'm all for it <laughs> right. any way to help market the show you know, we keep getting these comments on like youtube or even uh patreon you know people saying how do these guys not have more subs you know, and the plain, simple truth is we are shit at marketing. Um, we're complete utter shits at it. We're really bad at it. Like we're, yeah, yeah fantastically awful. Um, we just don't, we put, uh, and we, we have so much brain power is devoted to life, family, and the show in general, like the yes. content that yes. we really do not expend any effort whatsoever in anything else. That's right. Um, I just never think about it. I literally never think about it. People will be like, aren't you on Twitter? I'm like, it's the first time I thought of it in months. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's true. Same with me. That's why any word of mouth, you know, listeners right. help help spread love for the show. We we could use it. iTunes reviews uh, yeah. really and, help. But yes, anything to help market us. Yeah, as, and in a similar different note, though, um, I've been doing a lot more. I mean, for the last about three shows worth, so like the last six weeks, over the last six weeks or so, um, I've been um, you know st- uh, Twitch streaming a lot more on our on our Twitch channel. Oh. Um, you know, not consistently. It's been, it's been a little bit inconsistent, but it's been a few times a week to sometimes, you know, multiple days in a row. Playing games, weird games. I'm about to play a Cthulhu esque HP Lovecraftian game. <gasps> Ooh. Maybe even tonight. I don't know how tonight's gonna go. But yeah, mostly nights, sometimes in the afternoon. Um, and there's always been like one or two people that I've totally joining. Now I don't talk to them very often. No one says anything. I don't say anything either, but I just playing and people join. So that's kind well, of cool. whoever it is. Thank you for joining yes, us. Yes, whoever you are. Thanks for Village. always being there. You, they when they get the notification, they're on it. That's fantastic, man. I think yes. that's great. Yeah, whoever you are. Thank you. So that's been that's been also fun of fun. Been doing that. If you want to check us out, what's the Twitch channel? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And no, wait, Chicago Chicago SOS or is it SOS Chicago? Oh, dude, you totally put me on the spot. I thought you knew. I thought you because you're so good at this that I thought you might have known. I will place it in the show notes. Right. I'm writing it down. Mortem. So editing maneuver. (laughs) Editing magic. Editing magic. I just wrote it down. Add Twitch. Cool. Done. Yeah. Yeah. It will happen. Cool. Anyway. Do what I mean? Terrible at marketing. Terrible. (laughs) Yeah, we're really bad at it. (laughs) <laughs> anyway, but we have a Twitch channel. I po- I do games and I try to do creepy games and I've been successful overall. But every once in a while I do play like a fun lighter game. I don't I can't not everything is supernatural, but you know, um sometimes it is. Anyway, that said for that, I think you should tell us now that I mentioned a Twitch channel, you should tell us how else people can find us. Yeah, the easiest way, Oscar, for people to get to the Supernatural Occurrence Studies podcast is by going to our website, chicagoghostpodcast.com. From ChicagoGhostPodcast.com, you can get to all of our social platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and, of course, Patreon. Again, if you want to support the show, get uh, exclusive content, (laughs) join our Patreon. You're rusty. I am rusty. Oh, my God. See the Patreon link in this episode. Show notes. Uh, (laughs) We have a phone number. Chicago area code 872-529-0767. That's Chicago area code 872-529-0767. Leave us a message. Send us a text. We'll probably read them and play them on the show. 
<laughs> so sorry. That felt so unnatural. Oh, God, sorry, I, I know I, I could feel you feeling unnatural about it. Um, no, when we said you're rusty, it reminded me of this thing. Where, like, there's this like uh, I don't know if he's a doctor or a nurse, you know, local person that comes into my store every day, orders in advance, you know, on the phone, right? And his name is Rusty, and he's like, um, I remember one of my coworkers. He's like, oh, like I'm here for a mobile order, and then one of my partners or whatever said. Like, are you rusty? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, nah, you've been at it for a while now. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. It just, it cracked everyone. I was just like a really well-timed joke there. And you just reminded me of it. That's it. It was a very good kind of quasi-dad joke. I like it. Oh, yeah, no. I'm sure. Yeah. Sorry. That's it. Do we have anything else? <laughs> I don't. Should we take a break? Yes. Listeners, welcome back to the show. Well, the lights are turned down low. Hmm. The ceremonial candle is lit. Hmm. And the drinks are flowing. <laughs> Let's start this show. Now, Oscar, I know you have a whole intro. I'm going to pass it off to you in a moment. Mm -hmm. But I just, want, I just want the listeners to know, if they saw the title of this episode, mm -hmm. The Octopus Murders, this has nothing to do with an <laughs> eight-legged mollusk, does it? It's, you no, know, it does not. Eight-legged. No, it does not. Well, you know, they have brains in one of the mo mollusk tentacles. I, I did not know. <laughs> they, have two, they have two brains and shit. Yeah. Wow. Um, that's, what, that's what makes them able to, like, move, wriggle. Like to let's say flee something and also catch something with their other tentacles. They have like they can multitask because they have like two brains or something. It's like weird. They're very weird. Oh. But no, this has nothing to do with the underwater sea creatures. No. Interesting. Yeah, because the first time you you told me about this subject, that was my literal first question no. to you was, do, does octopus actually kill people in this one? Right. Like, no, stupid. <laughs> It's because of all the tentacles where where this story goes. It has the so weaves, many all the weaving happening, right? Yeah, and um, and it also surprised me further because you're more you are much more in you're much more um aware of uh, of conspiracies and and fucking cryptid all this shit that we've done in this show. Nearly exclusively, you've taught me because I didn't know anything about it. You're like, have you heard of this? No. Nope. And like, what? It's so famous? No, nope, I never heard of it. You know. It's now this time I, I give I, I give that to you. It feels great. That's how you must feel all the time. Yeah. It, so I know nothing right. about this topic, right? Um, but it goes to places that I think are going to blow people's minds. Mm -hmm. um, I know I've done very, 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 very high level research just to get names, dates, locations for for tags, for keywords, mm -hmm. or when I post this, I just, I wanted to get started on the episode, you know, get started on the post. Some of the articles that I pulled up that center around this, right. this murder or these murders, I guess you should say, blew my mind. Yeah. Uh, the, the tentacles <laughs> where they yeah. go. Right. It's, it's just amazing. So I just wanted to say that this is not about an octopus or pornographic about, <laughs> or, or pornographic. Right. Yeah. No, not right. at all. It's not that either. Uh, so with that, Oscar, uh, please take it away. I've been dying to hear this. All right. Sounds good. Let's go into my overdramatized introduction here. <laughs> <laughs> we probably should stop laughing. Okay. <clears throat> Where does the unraveling begin when there are multiple entries and loose strands and the fear of pulling on the wrong one will result in the loss of valuable time, effort, and will? That is the ball of mess and information I found myself in. I believe 
the disorganized nature of the embezzlement, the forgery, lying, stealing, appointing, arresting, threatening, and murdering that happens in this long tale actually makes it all seem more realistic, more human. Unfortunately, this feat of unraveling nearly shriveled my interest in pursuing this case to nothing because of how big and messy it was getting. I am heartened, however, that I came across this case after many of the answers have already been found by relentless people um, whose lives were you know, changed by the events, as you will hear shortly. Essentially, the victims or friends of the victims did most of the legwork, and it is their personal connection to the octopus murders that really piqued my interest at the start. So this story was first brought to my attention on TikTok by user, user, sorry, at Death Wish Princess, who gets into this grand tale of a triple murder that occurs in the 1980s and the relentless search by one of the victim's daughters that finally led to the killer decades later. Decades, not like a year or two. The woman in the video mentions conspirators and co-conspirators, as well as another murder that happens 10 years later. And she ends it all by saying the reason she knows all of this is because she's the granddaughter of one of the victims and that her mom was the one that found the killer. Cut to months later, three books, actually four now, and roughly 80 articles, and here we are. I wanted to mention the TikTok user whose video I will play later on to give people the ability to look her up if you want early spoilers and maybe a rough outline. Since there are so many characters, good and bad, from different sides and all walks of life, today's show will be centered solely on a triple murder in 1981, an apparent suicide in 1991, and establish an overall bedrock of information and people that makes this story stranger than fiction and one monumental conspiracy. A conspiracy that touches on all sorts of interesting keywords, such as government involvement, presidential involvement, the CIA, the mob, Native Americans, weapons manufacturing and selling, privacy hindering computer software, hitmen, journalists, the Iron Contra scandal, international dignitaries, political assassinations, and even aliens. Today's story will read like a film. There's like almost like a three-act structure naturally in play and a headstrong protagonist that tries to make sense of her crazy life. My advice to you is to try to pay attention. You never know the piece of information that would lead to a connection or an answer. So with that in mind, let's set the stage. The stage is Riverside County, California. This particular county has a lot of heft. As of the last census, Riverside County is the fourth most populous county in California and the 10th in the country. Pretty big. Pretty big. It's located in Southern California and has mostly desert between Los Angeles and Arizona. Most of Joshua Tree National Park is on Riverside and where most of all peyote in the world is consumed. Hey! <laughs> The city of Indio, one of the biggest locations in the county, lies next door to a small Indian reservation. Its resort cities are Palm Springs, Palm Desert, Indian Wells, La Quinta, Rancho Mirage, and Desert Hot Springs, all located in the Coachella Valley region of Riverside County. I bring up Coachella because it is where we'll spend a lot of our time in, particularly Indio and Rancho Mirage. That Indian reservation I teased a second ago is called Cabazon Band of Mission Indians. It is a federally recognized tribe of the Cahuilla Indians. I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. Whose, ter uh, whose original territory held 2,400 square miles of land in Southern California. Tribes splintered over the centuries into what are federally known as Western Cahuilla, Mountain Cahuilla, and Desert Cahuilla. The last one being Cabazon Band of Mission Indians, located seven miles outside of Indio 
and the tribe's headquarters located in India. It is a small tribe, having now enrolled uh, 38 enrolled members, according to the San Diego State University Library. That's not to say that there aren't more, just not recognized as yet, not to mention maybe the children that aren't old enough and the fact that each federally recognized tribe sets its own rules for membership. Either way, it's a small tribe, 38, and there is no unemployment for the Cabezon Band of Mission Indians. You might have guessed already, but this tribe found gainful employment on their land via a casino called Fantasy Springs Resort Casino. Have you heard of it? I have not. No. Okay. Apparently, it was a big deal when it was built. I don't know. But it's California, so. Cabezon Band of Mission Indians are known for three things. One is when they won the pivotal court case, California v. Cabezon Band, in the Supreme Court in 1987. They argue that their high-stakes bingo parlors and poker rooms were lawful because California state law couldn't touch it. This led to the second thing they're known for, their actual casino, which spent $200 million in 2004 to refurbish. This is after having had several expansions for millions more. The last thing Cabezon Band of Mission Indians are known for is what the public claimed they were involved in with a man named John Philip Nichols, something called the Wagon Hut Corporation, and finally, a triple homicide that occurred in 1981. Let's get into that. The following information comes from a myriad of sources, like local newspapers, retrospective magazine issues, and a good chunk from a book titled Return of the Buffalo, the story behind America's Indian gaming explosion. Prior to midnight on June 30th, 1981, three people were murdered in cold blood. Alfred M. Alvarez, Ralph Arthur Boger, and Patricia Roberta Castro. An investigator from the Riverside County Coroner's Office, Robert Drake, filed a report on the, mur on the murder. Quote, <clears throat> I was contacted by telephone at 7.34 a.m. on July 1st, 1981 by the Riverside County Sheriff's Office in Indio. I was told of a triple, murder, uh, triple homicide at 35040 Bob Hope Drive in the rural area of Rancho Mirage. The scene of this homicide is the backyard patio of the residence of Alvarez on that Bob Hope Drive. The three victims had been sitting in a semicircle Castro had been sitting on, the, on a single bed facing south. Alvarez was sitting to her right on a wooden chair, and Boger had been sitting to his right on a wooden chair facing north. They were discovered by friends of Alvarez, William Calloway and Joe R. Benitez, at about 6.40 a.m. on July 1st, 81. When found, Castro was lying back across the bed, head to the north. Alvarez was still sitting but slumped to the right while Boger was lying face down in the sand where he had fallen forward from his chair. All three were dressed, and from the initial distant examination, it appeared that all three had been shot in the head and had been dead for several hours, unquote. Alvarez, Castro, and Boger were each killed by one bullet to the back of the head. Examination of the bodies and the crime scene said that the killer slash killers were up close to their victims when they pulled the trigger. They were killed by 38 caliber bullets. And the reason I said killers, like plural, is because of how the victims were positioned when they died. It was theorized, that, it was theorized by police that since the shootings could not have occurred from afar, that it was most likely that the victims knew the killers beforehand. This is because there are no signs of force or running away from surprise attackers. And the fact that the victims were facing each other proves the theory that no number of attackers could sneak up behind Castro, Boger, and Alvarez without one of them seeing it first. They were each so, looking at each other. Right. They died in their last living positions, unaware of the 38 caliber bullets heading their way. The main reason police believe that it was more than one shooter, though, is because one or two of the victims were not alerted when the first shot rang out, say if they were maybe asleep or drunk, you know. Say that Bulger and Alvarez were killed first in their chairs, even though it is possible that Castro could have, you know, sat upright from the mattress she was laying in, 
she would have had enough time to try to flee or face the shooter, and the crime scene would have reflected that, but it didn't. The angle of each of the shots also came from different directions. So it's not like one person standing, shot, shot, and the third person, you know? It was from different directions. Oh, okay. Back of the head. Remember that. <clears throat> I should note that the reason the trio were chilling in the backyard was to escape the heat from inside, since there was no air conditioning. It explains the mattress, anyway. Autopsy did show 0.14% pleural fluid alcohol in Alvarez's system, while Bulger had 0.08% alcohol content, which is the base used to determine driver intoxication in California. There were no signs of drug use in the autopsies. Mm -hmm. Oddly, Patricia Castro's body was not examined for autopsy, and the coroner does not state why in his report. And I have no clue, by the way. Huh. My theory is that this could mean that the killers were maybe not known by the victims, that they had enough time to get into positions while the two men were intoxicated, you know, pop, pop, then head to the waking slash sleeping Castro for the final pop. I believe it's a stretch to think that one killer did the shooting, no matter how drunk, but it can mean that they weren't friends of Alvarez and company. You're saying we don't know. That the hitmen waited for the right time is what I believe most likely. I say hitmen because that's what the police thought that the triple murder had all the hallmarks of a professional hit. I'll get back to this later on. One important thing about this triple homicide to note is that nearly everyone, from local police to federal institutions, conspiracy theorists, friends, co-workers, and families of the deceased, not to mention yours truly, believe that the target was Fred Alvarez. By the end of this story, there is no way you'll think the shooter's were at Alvarez's home for anyone else but Alvarez. Okay. Castro okay. and Boger were innocent bystanders. Before we start speculating as to why and who wanted Fred Alvarez dead, there is one theory floating out there to suggest something else. Not long before his death, <clears throat> Fred revealed to a Dr. Nichols and tribal members of the band of Mission Indians that Patricia Castro's husband was soon to be released from prison and had passed the word along he was going to kill his wife's lover. Police were told about this, but nothing has come from it that I've read personally. That's the one Castro angle, anyway. You know, plus the possibility that she and Fred were lovers, which is possible. I honestly do not have much on the third victim, Ralph Boger. He had a family he barely saw, was divorced, he smoked weed and rode his motorcycle. <laughs> there was talk that he had made drug dealings with the Hells Angels and that he and Fred Alvarez have been accused of drug deals. And while it does serve as a potential reason for the triple slayings, the cleanliness of the crime scene and other information I will bring up here say otherwise. Okay. Now, Alvarez wasn't that special either. He was a big biker who, who became locally popular in his youth for wrestling and playing college football. He was assertive alpha and wasn't shy to let his temper intimidate you if it got him what he needed there was drug use and supposed drug deals which again some people think is what led to his demise in 81 but there's a mixed bag of highs and lows about what people thought of fred alvarez people liked him people didn't his importance to this case is that he was a tribal member of the cabazon band of mission indians he used to be one of the 30-something tribe members. Oh, uh, okay. That's what makes him important to this case. He made it as far as vice chairman before being demoted or voted out of that position. Reading the excerpts from the disclosed Cabazon Band meetings, you could tell that Fred Alvarez was going through a tough time. In the years before the tribe's win against the, Calif the state of California to build their grand casino, they did have poker rooms bingo parlors, and alcohol licenses, you know, to sell that shit. How and where on reservation land were these amenities produced was up to the tribe's votes. I'm not going to get into the intricacies of a tribal organization, but I will say that Fred Alvarez was a tribal officer when he died. He tried to get the votes to build his own poker room slash bar on the land. A woman who worked closely with Fred, mentioned to a reporter that he had also wanted topless dancers, but that's <laughs> beside the point here. Okay. 
After creating a rift and a faction against the majority to get the votes, Fred still lost. Not just a business opportunity, but he lost credibility within the tribe. These meetings were happening somewhere between March and June of 81, weeks before his death. There were complaints to the council that Fred was being uncooperative to patrons of the established poker rooms and bingo parlors, that he did not help others with their responsibilities on tribal land, that he selfishly expected help for his business venture and was butthurt when he didn't get it. <laughs> you know, this led to a few things that give this triple murder conspiracy some complicated spice. It was reported <clears throat> that Fred was meeting with journalists and telling close friends that he had information of embezzlement occurring on Cabazon Indian land. He hinted, yeah, he hinted that a John Philip Nichols, who did work for the Cabazon Band of Mission Indians, was into some very suspicious activity. So the Nichols family, which is John Philip Nichols, or he was called Nichols Sr. sometimes, his wife, Jo, jo uh, Joanne Nichols, I always confuse Joan and Joanne, sorry. His wife, Joanne Nichols, and his son, John Paul Nichols, also worked for the Cabazon Band of Mission Indians, but they weren't Indians themselves. They were not tribe members, but they were instrumental to the business dealings. It's safe to say that the reason Cabazon Band were able to get liquor licenses, cigarette licenses, and able to make important casino connections is in large part large part due to the nickels. I have a useful two-pronged example that shows how productive and resourceful this little family was, especially in the 70s and 80s. Quote, during this meeting, Dr. Nichols, meaning John Philip Sr., made two significant reports, the first of which described recent trips he had taken to Taiwan, Korea, and Japan and of his meeting with local and lumber purchasers in those countries. His trips there were financed by Wallace Shipping Chartering Limited, a company trying to market coal to those and other countries, and it was paying a monthly fee to use Dr. Nichols as a, as a consultant. These fees were being used by Nichols and the tribe to meet office expenses and stay alive as an economic development entity. Nichols' second report, according to the minutes, discussed the advantages of forming an Indian security company and becoming eligible to apply for contacts with minority preference. He indicated that Wackenhut Incorporated and Intersect Incorporated were both well-known security firms which have been interested in working with an Indian firm. After his presentation, Fred Alvarez moved to draft a resolution calling for the formation of Cabazon Security Company. The motion was seconded by John James and passed unanimously, unquote. These guys knew how to get shit done. So John, John Sr., he's a, he's a mover and a shaker. He's kind of the spagone. He's the one that makes things connect and happen. And That's uh, exactly right. Does he, make so, a, does he have a, is there like a type of a person in your head based on that? Oh, oh sure. I mean, I, I know plenty of people who. I know very few. Who, who are like that or, or who, who want to pretend they're like that anyway. You right. know? Oh, yeah, there's uh, that too. Yeah. But now my question is, did these murders happen on tribal land? No. They did not. Okay. The house on okay. Rancho Mirage is uh, <clears throat> like 15 minutes away. Okay. I was wondering because, you know, tribal land, that's a whole nother. Yeah, it's not. Justice system. Uh, no. you know, they, that's they why I gave the, that's why I gave the address and uh, I said Ranch Mirage. Yeah, it's not on tribal land. The murders happened. That, that is not tribal land. Okay, yeah. got I do, it. I do, I uh, do, do make the, I do hammer that later. But yeah, no, it's okay. No, no. I, I would just good for question. my own. No. Good question. Yeah. Um, let's see. The reports lend some nuance into what Cabazon Band was into, and what led to their massive success in the '90s and 2000s. Not to mention that it helps explain key information and figures as to the scope of this conspiracy. The reports tell us that while Dr. Nichols was employed at the, res at the reservation as a manager, he actually was more of a resource developer and financial advisor. The reports also say that the reason Cabazon Band's involvement with Wackenhut and other companies was mainly financial reasons, were mainly financial reasons. Wackenhut will be dealt with in great detail at some point. Part two. Do not worry. All of these reports say that John Philip Nichols, whom Fred Alvarez allegedly told outsiders and insiders, 
was into some heavy shit and very possibly illegal. There is no evidence of this, but people say that Fred Alvarez disapproved of Dr. Nichols's leadership and high status as a non-member of an Indian reservation, which may help explain why he wanted his own poker room and dismissed the rest. It was also reported, though not in evidence again, that Alvarez knew that John Philip Nichols was embezzling casino funds and had set up a meeting for July 1st, 1981, the day he was found dead to try to fire him. Mm -hmm. Reading the minutes from his final few meetings with the tribe, I have to say that there's no evidence to support this. It should also be mentioned that it was tribal policy to count the earnings made in those bingo parlors and poker rooms daily to thwart any skimming. Adding fuel to the fire, people have also said that Alvarez knew or suspected that Nichols involved the Cabazon tribe into arms dealings with the government. And I will get to that eventually. Yeah. These are the threads that conspiracy theories from 1980 to present day believe led to the triple homicide. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So arms dealing, mm -hmm. casinos, liquor licenses, tribal uh, land. Shady money, like gray area money, right? Yeah, this Wacken Hut. I'm, I'm curious to see. Where Have that, you ever heard of them? Only, I think I, I read it briefly when kind of looking for the keywords well, for this. I mean, uh, before today. I have not, no. Interesting, but I'm, I I'm have heard of if, them before. Oh, have you really? Mm -hmm. I wonder if it started out as kind of like a shell dummy company to run money through or something to clean money. I'm not sure. Oh, I can tell you right now, not, not in a spoiler way, but uh, they're very real. They work all okay, around the world. So they're, they're up and up. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, they, but they're just so big. They're huge. Yeah. We'll get more. Yeah. That's an entire segment for part two. Trust me. Okay. <clears throat> now, the tribe made a press release concerning this tragedy. Quote, the Cabazon Band of Mission Indians express its sorrow over the death of Fred Alfred Alvarez, a member of the band. His untimely death, along with those of Patricia Castro and Ralph Bolger, are most unfortunate. We publicly, ex publicly express our condolences to the immediate family and friends of the three victims. Since the deaths did not occur on federal land, the state of California, County of Riverside, County of Riverside has jurisdiction. Mr. Blaine Clark, the capable sheriff of Riverside County, has our full confidence in being able to solve these deaths. We as a tribe will help and cooperate in any way we can with the sheriff's office. The Cabazon Band of Mission Indians respects the American judicial system and knows that justice will prevail. We wish to state categorically that the unfortunate incident which involved the three victims, only one of whom was a tribal member, was wholly unrelated to Cabazon tribal business or the operation of our tribal casino. We are in possession of certain evidence which we have already turned over to the county sheriff's office, which indicated that the murders may have been attributed to personal relationships between the victims and other persons unconnected in any way with the Cabazon band. We are confident that when the case is solved, as it will be, and all the facts are disclosed, their charges and innuendos will be shown to be groundless. Until that time, we would only ask that the press deal with this tragedy in a responsible and professional manner and not allow itself to be used by those with ulterior motives, unquote. That is one hell of a statement. Actually, I cut some parts of it out, by the way. But yeah, yeah, that's a hell of a statement. Wow. Yeah. So I'm taking, because uh, they mentioned right there, you know, these charges are unfounded, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm guessing there were already rumors swirling that, Insane amount, had, an insane amount of them. Yeah, had something to do with whacking this guy. Okay, okay. And, and their pe their plea to tell their their plea to the press to to like, hey, you know, be, you know, be nice. Totally does not work. You're about to find <laughs> it really doesn't work. The fact that we're here talking about it, it means that it didn't work. Um, oh, okay, okay, right? good. Like the very fact that there's so many books about it that I'm fucking burnt out over. Um, <clears throat> it's safe to say that this did nothing to quell journalists townsfolk, and conspiracy theories from making Fred Alvarez a martyr. The tribe was harassed daily with questions of their involvement with the triple murder. As frustrated as they were with journalists, who were, you know, indeed damaging the Cabazon band image, the real fight was with the police. 
they raided this federally recognized Indian land a couple times, taking lots of documents and questioning everybody that might lead to an arrest. This is not strange behavior for the tribe, though. For some time before Alvarez met his demise, county and local police had some hate for this tribal territory. They opposed and fought the selling of cigarettes, alcohol, and bringing gambling to their corner of the world. Lots of court dates and threats, guys. It makes sense why the tribe quickly made that press release and fully cooperated with statements and paperwork only a day or two after the triple murders. It didn't help much, and since Cabazon Band of Mission Indians got the last laugh with their big court win, you know, in the mid-80s, the harassment and traumatic image in the public subsided over the years, for the most part. Let's bring a woman in here, a woman named Rachel Begley on board. Rachel Begley was 13 years old when her father, Ralph Boger, was killed in Rancho Mirage, California. Much of the following comes from a Wired article in 2011. Quote, she learned of her father's death from a television news bulletin. Her parents were divorced, and though she spent occasional days with her dad riding in his, in his motorcycle sidecar, she didn't know enough about his life to make sense of what had happened. The police would eventually conclude that Boger and Alvarez were killed in connections with shady doings at the nearby Cabezon Indian Reservation. Hmm. But Begley's mother shielded her from all the murky details of the investigation. After the murders, Begley went through a rebellious phase and fell in with a bad crowd. By the time she was 15, she was pregnant and had dropped out of high school. Eventually, she got her GED and moved to Iowa. She says she would periodically wonder about the case and check in with the police, who never seemed to have any new information. Beyond that, she didn't have time or tools to delve too deeply. Then one night in 2007, she idly typed her father's name into Google. She didn't find much, but as she clicked through the few results that came up, she found a book titled The Octopus, Secret Government and the Death of Danny Casolaro. Huh. Based on the work of a free French freelance journalist, the book argued that the 1981 triple slaying was wrapped up in an, enorm in an enormous plot involving arms dealing, private security firms, and the upper echelons of the Reagan administration. Skeptical but intrigued, Bagley dug deeper and discovered that over the years, the murder case had taken a curious life of its own preserved on obscure websites and nurtured by a grassroots community of obsessives. To these, to these conspiracy theorists, Boger's killing was the work of a secret syndicate they called the Octopus because its tangled tentacles supposedly reached into some of the most powerful organizations in the world. Unquote. The Octopus. Mm -hmm. Man, is that a cool name for a secret murderous organization cool. holy shit isn't it cool yeah yeah i mean we're kind of like jonesing about the bad part of this but yes <laughs> yeah yeah i know it's terrible isn't it yeah yeah i get it but imagine being this this poor girl you know mm -hmm. finding this out about your dad your dad could have been involved in this massive conspiracy mm -hmm. crazy yeah. well if you believe what i believe that he was just an innocent bystander he, but he was still a part of it technically yeah yeah I mean, and that's pretty sensational, isn't it? You can see how Rachel Begley turns into like a Michelle McNamara type of investigator. Just a just a more low rent, but with a personal skin in the game. You can Absolutely. Also, right? You can see that. You can also see how this, this is catnip for reporters. The story sells itself. Rachel began her investigation late in the game, but managed to find much of the important information that links motives to the triple murder, and other hits and shady dealings. By hits, I mean assassinations. She discovered that police initially suspected John Philip Nichols of committing the murders because of what the local papers like Daily News, Voice of the Valley, printed concerning Alvarez's speculation of embezzlement with the casinos. We know the truth of that, but he was the first suspect investigators focused on. Through Nichols, Rachel found out that he and Cabazon struck a partnership with a private security firm that has clients around the globe called Wackenhut. 
Many books and articles came out in the early 1990s talking about this. Publications like those led Rachel Begley to find out that the Cabazon slash Wackenhut partnership led to the manufacturing of arms on federal Indian land. Oh, right. More digging led to finding out that a big portion of the information and connections were discovered by a freelance journalist who died in 1991, Danny Casolaro. I will focus on him soon enough. Quote, most of the stuff I didn't believe, Begley says. I thought all of these people were making money off of my dad's murder, writing these books. She was angry enough, in fact, that she was determined to prove the speculators wrong. At the time, Begley was working in customer service for an internet service provider, which was moving its back office operations to another state, and she was spending her days sitting idly at her computer, waiting to get laid off. Begley had once worked for a collections agency, and she knew how to track people down. I went into it with a mindset, I guess, almost like a police officer would, she says. <clears throat> no one had ever been charged in the killings. Nichols was long gone. He had died of a heart attack in 2001. But Begley talked to Alvarez's sister, who recounted her family's thwarted efforts to get, to the, to get the police to pursue the case. She found, she then found William Hamilton, the developer of the Promise software, who had collaborated with Casolaro on his investigation. Hamilton called her back on her cell phone as she was leaving for work one day, and then talked and talked until his battery died. It was like, boom, she said later on. He dumped it all in my lap. Begley may have started out trying to resist the octopus, but she gradually gave into the theory's implications, which is that her father had been caught up in a vast conspiracy and it had killed him, unquote. You've said a lot there. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of little tidbits in that quote. That's why, I, that's why I gave you the beat sign. Like, okay, if you want to say something. So you alluded to a, a suicide in 91 at mm -hmm. the top of the show yes. during your intro. So here's I'm the teasing the yeah, the next Casolaro, right? Mm -hmm. Casolaro was the journalist who supposedly committed suicide. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing you mentioned that was really interesting. Um, oh, God, it just <laughs> flew out of my mind. Is it the Hamilton? Uh, yes, yes, the Promise software. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. The Promise software. Yeah. Uh, P-R-M-I-S, I believe. P-R, I think it's the whole, isn't it the whole thing? P-R-O-M-I-S? I don't think it is. Is that what it is? I'm pretty sure it's without the E, but all capitalized. It's like it's an it's a um, acronym, not anagram. Acronym. PRMIS. I thought it was PRM. I, I saw that today during well, my maybe, high maybe level it's not, research. Maybe, but I've been reading it that way. Maybe I got it all wrong in my head. Okay, let's just. Say I just anyway. wanted to bring it up in case people wanted to follow that rabbit hole on their own. I'm promise. That, do that, yeah, that's research. another thing that I'm kind of encouraging slash discouraging along with the show is that if you want to find out in due time, by all means, wait along with the script with me. And next time, and maybe next time after that. And then so you could get the pieces together as I write it and as I tell it to you, I think will be more fun. However, if you can't wait, that's why I gave you, that's why I gave them the TikTok user at the top. That's why I'm giving all these names also, even though I'm not going to explain them yet, I'm giving the names out in case people who have not heard of this at all, like you, um, want to look forward and ahead. You know? Got it. Got it. Yeah, those are the two big things I, I pulled out there. For sure. For sure. That's a big ass fucking thing. The promise thing. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Here it comes. I promise that I'll get to, to the Promise Software scandal soon enough, but I like how Rachel said it. It was like, boom, he dumped it all in my lap. It's starting to feel like that's what I'm doing. Just dumping shit on your lap, you know? Already, there's a bunch of new information, but the bombardment is not over. Continuing Rachel's discovery and trying to put a fi finale bow to 1981 triple murders, here's a news clip from 2008. It is edited for time. Seven years. Tonight, we have an exclusive interview with the daughter of one of those murder victims. Her search for her father's killers has jump-started this cold case. Three people executed in 1981 at this Rancho Mirage home. There are few clues and no arrests. Fred Alvarez was vice chairman of the Cabazon Band of Mission Indians. Back then, they had a card room. Today, they have Fantasy Springs Casino. Alvarez's friend, Ralph Boger, was also murdered. He was likely at the wrong place at the wrong time. 
His daughter, Rachel, was never satisfied with the lack of progress in the murder case. When I was 16, I decided to go out and try and figure out what was going on with all this. And I went down to the murder scene and to the reservation. And a week later, I was getting death threats. Fred Alvarez was planning to blow the whistle on a business partnership between defense contractor Wackenhut Services and Cabazon manager John Philip Nichols to form Cabazon Arms. Nichols allegedly planned on using Indian land to test and build pistols, assault rifles, sniper guns, and rocket launchers. The partnership was interested in biological weapons that could be deployed in small countries. I even have uh, things in place should anything happen to me to where this will not drop. We're not dropping this investigation either. We now have internal defense contractor memos revealing two other local Indian tribes that planned on heavy weapons testing on reservations. We'll expose them in our next investigation piece. If you've missed any part of this 33-part exclusive investigation, more than one year in the making, catch up with our reports on KESQ.com. If you didn't catch it, that clip is the 33rd part of a long series that investigated the triple murders and other deaths and connections. It's from WESQ.com if you want to see what they found. To say that they have a video version of this podcast is only half correct. I believe I have more info, but they actually talk to the people involved. So, you know, the news clip doesn't mention that one of the weapons that were being manufactured on tribal land was fuel air explosives, which will be key to remember later. Again, It says that Alvarez was pissed off about this and that, but there isn't much of his worries on paper or testimonies as you would think. Regardless, the weapons angle is worth killing someone over, and a man like John Philip Nichols, as resourceful and connected as he was, could do it. A good portion of the Wired piece of uh, Rachel Begley's journey of discovery is spent on learning the ropes of conspiracy circles. Navigating through trial and error, reasonable and nut jobs alike, not jobs alike, <laughs> learning which sites were taken more seriously, who could trust her inquiries, and in turn, who could she eventually trust? This led to a friendship with a woman named Cherry Seymour. Quote, the two sealed their friendship with a transaction of weather documents, the octopus community's customary medium of exchange. Copying Seymour's files, which the author had gathered from archives, courts, and confidential sources hidden trailer. Begley glimpsed the far reaches of the speculation, bioweapons, Lebanese heroin shipments, Howard Hughes, and the Yakuza. Oh, unquote. Oh, my God. Howard Hughes and the Yakuza, too. How do you put those in the same breath as this? I don't think that's ever been spoken aloud in the same sentence. That's what I said when I read the article. (laughs) That's exactly what I said. I'm like, I don't think those two things I've ever been combined in the the entirety of history. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. I'm just fucking teasing y'all. All All right. Cherry Seymour's big contribution to this conspiracy is a book that was published in 2010 titled The Last Circle. Danny Casalaro's investigation into the octopus and the Promise software scandal. This book, which I barely started reading this weekend, is on the short list of must reads for anything relating to the octopus conspiracy. Food for thought there. Moving on, Rachel Begley began posting on Facebook and YouTube to educate others, but to also gain the attention to of anyone that might be involved somehow. After several videos documenting her investigations, Rachel was surprised to get a call from the cold case unit from Riverside County. She was dismissed a year earlier as a nut job by Riverside County authorities, but this time they called her to say that the investigation was being reopened. Rachel, focused and determined, found a prime suspect in the murder of her father, a man named Jimmy Hughes. Let's get into it. California has a state version of the Freedom of Information Act called California Public Records Act. And the grand majority of what I found about Jimmy Hughes comes from the families of the murder victims, police, Cabazon Indian tribe members obtaining files this way. 
they in turn send copies to people like Rachel Begley and Cherry Seymour who write books and post videos, which is how I know. This is as direct as I can get. Even though it's, it's denied later, it's clear that Jimmy Hughes worked for Cabazon Band of Mission Indians, at least from 1980 to 1984. His role there was that of a security guard working under John Philip Nichols. Paperwork, calling him a security guard, became hard to find after the triple murder of Alvarez, Castro, and Bulger, but it's clear in the minutes I read from a meeting in August of 1980. The Tribal Business Committee was trying to set up a trap and skeet range, and Jimmy Hughes, labeled as security guard, was recommended for help. The report of that meeting reflect the exhaustive planning that went into this range. But here's another big example of Hughes on Cabazon payroll. Quote, <clears throat> on March 3rd, 1983, the Cabazon Bingo Palace opened for business. This time, the Riverside County Sheriff closed it down. The tribe went to court, and on May 6, 1983, Judge Waters issued a preliminary injunction against the county. He also imposed a bond of $50,000 on the tribe. Like I said, the cops didn't like this shit. Oof. Right. Two years later, after thwarting an attempted takeover by Wayne Reeder, Peter Zokoski, John Patrick McGuire, and Jimmy Hughes, which later devolved into charges by Reeder of threats on Reeder's life by Hughes on counter charges, the tribe was hit by a 2020 Geraldo Rivera TV report that gave national coverage to distortions of reality. As a result, the tribe would suffer ter terrible public cred credibility problems until February 25th, 1987. Unquote. Fucking Geraldo, man. Geraldo, yeah. Everyone knows him. I mean, not everyone, I guess. He's that old now. But ask your parents, you know. But yeah, the credibility problems until February 25th, 1987 is timely because that's when they win the court against uh, the Supreme Court case with against California to make their casino. So. Ah, I see. Okay. Makes sense. I'm surprised the police were able to go on to tribal lands and shut that. The, uh, yeah, the bingo hall I, again. Down. I don't know how it works. Yeah, really, yeah, me neither. Yeah, so it must have happened. I mean, they clearly did it. So, um, a journalist for the Desert Sun, a man named John Hussar, I'm gonna call him Hussar, from the mid 80s to the mid 90s, wrote several articles smearing and convicting many people connected to Cabazon tribe of crazy sounding things, mainly involving arms dealing and South America. What he wrote about Jimmy Hughes is as follows and comes from from the book uh, that, I read, that I mentioned earlier, Return of the Buffalo. And uh, I should say right now, this is the only time I have time to say it. Return of the Buffalo tries to dismiss the conspiracy theories that people talk about with this tribe. It kind of fails at it, but it does clear up some things. So I think it did some good jobs too. Anyway, sorry. Quote, third in who's, oh, sorry. Third in Hussar's string is the conviction of Dr. Nichols, followed by the fourth, which repeats the drug-crazed allegations of one Jimmy Hughes, given the false title of former tribal security chief, a title he never held, which is true. Hussar writes that Hughes had filed a statement in 1984 charging there was profit skimming at the Cabazon Bingo Palace and that the Cabazons and the Nicholses family were involved in gun running missions in Central and South America. By publishing this, Hussar was republishing two blatant lies. There have been no gun running missions by the Cabazons or the Nichols anywhere in the world. And Hughes was never a Cabazon security chief. In his repetition of these lies, he then added that Hughes claimed to be a bagman for Nichols in the Alvarez murder. At no time has Hussar written the truth about Hughes, the speed freak, although the truth was available and Hughes was never a bagman for Nichols or the Cabazons for any purpose, unquote. Now that's the bias of the book, right? That's how the book writes it. But what do you think of that real quick? Because a couple of truths, a couple of not truths there. One, he wasn't a security chief. He was, a, he was an officer, security officer, for sure. 
But uh, you're right. He wasn't a security chief. So right there, the journalist is getting something wrong, perpetrating yeah. a lie, like he said. The gun running is technically right, only in the sense that you're right. I guess they didn't do it themselves. But if they're made there and sent out by someone else, same problem, different level, you know, that's my thought on that anyway. But interesting how people are trying to dismiss this stuff as you as you as you read more. It's fucking weird. Right. Yeah, it's kind of that's what's hard to kind of parse out some of this stuff. It was well known by several people at the time that Jimmy Hughes had a taste for methamphetamine. Hughes was fired as a security guard in 1984 and banned from the reservation. On his way out, according to what was reported by the sheriff, quote, he, meaning Hughes, became argumentative and belligerent and invited me to step outside. I stepped outside with him, but he made no effort to strike me. We were joined by Charles Wilmus, security guard, uh, Treasure Wilmus, Virginia Wilmus, Carol T. Garden, all employees of the Bingo Palace. By the way, they sound like stripper names. I'm sorry. Uh, T. Garden, <laughs> come on. What is that? And Dr. John Nichols. Dr. Nichols tried to reason with him, but to no avail. Jimmy Hughes directed his angle toward Dr. Nichols, told him his days were numbered. A minute or two later, just before entering his car, he told Dr. Nichols, quote, you better leave the state, unquote. On his way out of the parking lot, three or four shots were fired. I can only assume they were fired by Jimmy Hughes, unquote, for real. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. So he's kind of an asshole. Yeah, clearly, clearly. I, that's what I wrote here. Clearly an asshole right after that. <laughs> You're pointing to the screen. It's fine. <laughs> right, like you can see me. So we got meth head Jimmy. We don't know. We don't know how he's connected yet, truly. Uh, I mean, he's not to Cabazon. That's established. That's what I'm establishing here. And that he knew Nichols threatened him and all that. Got fired from working there. Banned from okay. the reservation. But connected to the, the triple murder, though. Well, he just said it, right? He said it in a heated thing that, um, well, people were saying that he was a bag man for the Alvarez hit. We don't know right. if he had said that yet, but, you know, he is pissed at Nichols for something or other. I will get to that. Don't worry. All this will be explained. But yes, he is. You're going to find out he's something connected for sure. Mm. Heading back to Rachel Begley in 2007, she became interested in Jimmy Hughes because of articles written in the 80s and 90s, like Hussar's pieces. A note to remember is that back in 84, Hughes implicated Nichols Sr. to police that he was using cash payments to unidentified contract killers for the Alvarez hit, which he called U.S. government covert action. He called it that. We don't know if it's true. After a while, Police shifted suspicions to Hughes, at which point fled town and the grand jury investigation stopped. They just let him go. Well, he fled town before they could, you know, properly get him for it. But yeah, he told the police, hey, this guy might have killed Alvarez. And like, well, how do you know that? So they turned their heads to him and he fled, mm. basically. Uh, they call him an informant in the report that I read. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see, where am I? Right. Here's what Begley found out and later reported by places like WESQ, Fox News, and Wired, and so forth. Begley discovered that Hughes became an evangelical minister stationed in Honduras, but with programs all over, including the states. Honduras. Sorry, I didn't say it the right way. This ministry began in <laughs> sorry. <laughs> this ministry began in 1995. And it provided services in Central America to battered women, drug addicts, and others. The website doesn't exist anymore, but it did have an autobiographical essay that was written by Hughes. It talks about how he had an elite military training, which companies like the Wackenhut security firm was known for doing, and had a career as a contract killer. That his life was transformed when he was born again. It was called Jimmy Hughes Ministries, and its headquarters was in Miami, Florida. Jimmy Hughes kind of reminds me of David Berkowitz at the end there. Remember? Oh, the, yeah, the big transformation. Finding religion, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, what a convenient way to also have uh, locations to send guns to. Yeah, 
Yeah, I wonder if all the gun running to Central America maybe, you know, establish some places, some people, right? I don't know. Interesting, man. Mm -hmm. Begley found out that Hughes was scheduled to address an evangelical banquet in Fresno, California. On February, on February 2008, Rachel Begley had a hidden camera in her purse as she confronted Jimmy Hughes. Whoa. Quote, Hughes, a stocky 51-year-old with a graying buzz cut and raspy voice, bounded around, bellowing tales of his past brutality. Begley, nervous and bleary-eyed from a sleepless cross-country flight, exchanged incredulous text messages with an accomplice who had come along as backup, Mikkel Alvarez, Fred's son. Huh. Yeah, they banded, totally met together about this. When Hughes finished his performance, Begley and Alvarez came forward with a rush of adrenaline, introducing themselves to the sweat-soaked evangelist, evangelist as the children of the murder victims. Can't say nothing about that, Hughes stammered. It's a long time ago. It's in the past. Not for us, Begley said insistently. We're trying to get resolution. I don't care who got killed, Hughes shouted, attracting the bewildered attention of others at the banquet. I was trained in the military. I killed people all over the world, right or wrong, because the government ordered me to. Hughes stalked off, fuming, and Begley began to cry. That seemed to bother the minister because he came back, speaking in a tone that was softer but full of veiled menace. Apparently, he had seen her web videos. Are you aware that that goes all over the world? Are you crazy, lady? Hughes said. Think about your children. They need a mother. He told Begley and Alvarez that the murder was a mafia hit, and though he didn't explicitly admit to carrying it out, he intimated that he knew much more. Your parents were involved in some very dangerous things, Hughes said. It's a lot bigger than just the murder of this guy or the murder of that guy. You're talking political people. You've got babies to take care of, Mama. Go home tonight and be at peace. Suddenly, the murky crime had come into focus and the conspiracy theorists confronted with, un with an unaccustomed feeling, vindication, unquote. You gave me the, I mean, that, that gave me the chills. I hope so. When he came back, that gave me the chills. Mm -hmm. You got babies to take care of, mama. Yeah, the way he says that. Yeah. <sighs> what a Hollywood scene. Yeah, I'm telling you, this feels like a movie. What a Hollywood scene. It's such a movie. I can see this guy stalking around on stage, right? Getting, mm -hmm. getting people mm -hmm. whipped up in a frenzy. He's whipped up in a frenzy. I think and then, Kevin Spacey could do it. Yeah. Although yeah. I know he's like taboo right now, but oh, that's, yeah, why he's I, been, that's why it would work, honestly. Yeah, he, he's he been canceled. Yeah. Uh, and then to have him come back out and, and boom, right there in front of his face with the kids. Oh, Vincent D'Onofrio. He's a big guy. He could do it too. Oh, Vincent D'Onofrio would be good. Have you gone? Sorry, I don't know why we're pitching this. Um, but the, yeah, then boom, there's the kids of two of the murder victims. Uh, yeah. What a scene. Jesus. Right? Here's something else here. Well, part of the same. All but one of the videos remain from Rachel Bagley's YouTube channel, which is called Desert Fay. Desert and then Fay, F-A-E, all one word, if you want to look it up. Desert Fay. I have no concrete reason why. Maybe it was how Rachel was able to live in peace after the events. But regardless, here's a clip of her confrontation with Jimmy Hughes. It's a long time ago. Where in the past? It's not far. You know what? I'm trying to get resolution on a lot of things in my life. Some things I'd like to forget. Listen to me. I want to forget about the past. It is ever so awful and scary in my past. I don't live there anymore. I don't got nothing to do with that. Screw the FBI. Screw the police. Screw everybody else in my past. I don't care about my past. I, there's uh, The world I live in is screwed up and messed up. There's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of... You know what? What you need to do is let God come into your heart. And what you need to do is say, Lord, pray my father's in heaven. Lord, I pray when I die. I go to heaven. Lord, do you have children? No. Do you have children? Pray for your children. Love your children. Protect your children. Listen, what's your name? What's your name? 
Let me tell you something. How full. You know, the world we live in is full of a lot of things. But if what you're asking though, me to do... No, I'm asking you to make amends. That's all right. Make amends for what? For acting in our father's No, 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 Excuse me. Well, I don't care. I'm 51 years old. I turned 51 three days ago, and I didn't give a crap about that. So let me tell you something. Let me put it very clear. Let me put it very clear. I don't care about people. People don't, people don't rule my life. God rules my life. And I'm not afraid of you, and I'm not afraid of what no, people say. Let me tell you something. I'm not afraid of what people don't make me or break me. Let me tell you something. I go to bed at night with a clear conscience. I wake up in the morning with a clear conscience. So let me tell you something about my past. My past is dead. I don't care about my past. My past is my past. It's none of your business. It's none of your business. It's nobody's business. I don't care who died. I don't care who got killed. I, I, I was trained in the military. I kill people all over the world. Right or wrong, because the government ordered me to. And go to the cops. Go to the police and ask them to do it. Why don't they get off their butt and take Mr. Dr. Nichols to jail or somebody who had something to do with it? I'm not allowed to, not allowed to say anything. Don't you understand? Okay. Who's I'm not allowed to say anything. Is it I'm not allowed to say nothing. I can't. Is it the police telling you can't say anything? There are other people here to see you. There are other people. I know it's a little hard to hear and a little fast, so that's why I wanted to mention, the, put in the, the dialogue of what he said first and then put the clip in. So hopefully you guys understood it fine enough and followed it. But yeah, that's what the motherfucker said. So, And that, that was from her secret her, recording. Her hidden camera and her hidden purse. Hidden camera. Mm -hmm. Wow. Audio wow. and hidden. Obviously, the, the camera itself doesn't show anything because it's in the purse. So it's just the audio, really. But still, it's all it's all him. Wow. Yeah. Rachel didn't take this lying down. She joined forces with a man named John Powers. Here's a bit of Powers from his LinkedIn bio that I found. He began his career with law enforcement in 1985 with the Coast Guard. And starting in 1989, he began, he, sorry, he began, he spent the next 26 years with the Riverside County Sheriff's Department as a patrolman, narcotics investigator, homicide detective, and finally, sergeant. John was selected to develop and implement a cold case team while he was a homicide detective. John Powers connected with Begley after seeing the video of her encounter with Jimmy Hughes saying, quote, the statements she got from him, no police officer would have ever been able to get, unquote. Powers was tasked to get into the 1981 murders and formed a partnership with Rachel Begley to arrest Jimmy Hughes. Oh. Mm -hmm. That's right, because now it's reopened at this point. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A few things to note at this time. Remember that grand jury investigation that began in the 80s by Riverside Police against Jimmy Hughes? This is when he informed on the police that uh, John, that, uh, John Nichols was responsible right, for paying someone off to kill Alvarez. Yeah. That investigation that had barely begun anyway, John Powers found it odd that he could not find it. He said it had simply disappeared. Of course. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that means. He doesn't know either. After what the article called procedural wrangling, a warrant was finally issued for Jimmy Hughes in August 2009. He was arrested at Miami Dade International Airport in October, trying to get to Honduras. 52 years old in 2009, Hughes faced three counts of murder in the execution style shootings of Cabazon tribal official Alfred Alvarez and his friends Patricia Castro and Ralph Boger. There was also a count of conspiracy to commit a crime. Very important. The official reason for the warrant goes basically like this. Hughes conspired with John Philip Nichols and his son, John Paul, as well as other parties to prevent Alvarez from exposing illegal activities occurring at the Cabazon Indian Reservation. It's beginning to feel like the final 15 minutes of a crime thriller movie. <laughs> Jumping to July 1st, 2010, the 29th anniversary of the triple murders, an important hearing takes place in an Indio courtroom. Octopus community vets like Cherry Seymour sits among the reporters. This is the part of the movie where justice is carried out, but alas, it does not. Quote, 
then Michael Murphy, a dapper prosecutor from the attorney general's office, rose and delivered a shocking blow. We have lost confidence in our ability to proceed with the prosecution, he said. Begley closed her eyes tightly as the prosecutor gave a vague reason for his sudden about face, something about new information and a reassessment of the evidence. Afterwards, Powers stood next to Beg Begley outside the courtroom as she addressed the television cameras, sobbing. The detective was disgusted by the outcome. The attorney general's office gave no further public explanation for its decision. But Powers sensed that the prosecutors were eager to dump the case. Murphy, he said, started to question the credibility of the witnesses that Begley had uncovered. Throughout all this, Begley had used Twitter and Facebook to mobilize the octopus believers to pressure Murphy, sorry, and at least a few called the prosecutor to urge him to look beyond Hughes and dig into the myriad connection that they had spent decades documenting. Begley's devotion and inventive use of the internet had helped ensnare Hughes, but the obsessions of her fellow travelers may have helped to undermine the prosecutor's confidence. Oh, man. Murphy declined to comment, unquote. So, so her fellow conspiracy... Mm -hmm. Like they went Circles. too hard. They got. They were too excited. Like they like they found out that the girl said yes to the first date, and they go there, and they're too fucking nervous. They talk too fucking fast. They're too excited, and they ruin the date. So sort of and they destroy the credibility. Yeah. Oh, what a kick in the teeth. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't talk to conspiracy theorists because if we're ever actually proven right, we're gonna, how are we going to contain ourselves? <laughs> how? How will you contain yourself, Jay? I oh, you can't. You can't. I can't. Anyway. On July 2nd, 2010, the LA Times had a little more on this matter. Quote, During a court hearing in Indio, Deputy Attorney General Mike Murphy told a Riverside County Superior Court judge that his office was dropping the charges because of new evidence uncovered by state prosecution, prosecutors sorry, investigating the 29-year-old case. Neither Murphy nor a spokesman for, for Attorney General Jerry Brown provided details on those new findings. So I don't know what it was. We conducted an exhaustive, an exhaustive review of the evidence provided by the Sheriff's Department. We re-interviewed key witnesses and uncovered additional evidence tied to the case, said Evan Westrup, a spokesman for Brown. This process and the new information of our office this and, and the new information our office discovered materially changed our assessment of the nature and quality of the evidence. Hughes was expected to be released from jail, authorities said. The attorney general's office asked that the charges be dismissed without prejudice, meaning charges could be filed at a later date. The attorney general's office had been prosecuting the case because Hughes is a distant cousin of Riverside County's District Attorney Rod Pacheco. Pacheco lost a bid for re-election in June to Riverside County Superior Court Judge Paul Zallerback, however, creating the possibility that the new district attorney could take over the case. So that's why it was sent to this other district, because there was an actual conflict of interest here. Wow. Mm-hmm. Didn't see that one coming. No, I didn't see that one either <laughs> coming, but nothing's come from it. I looked up in the sky. It's pretty normal. Begley, who worked closely with detectives from the Riverside County Sheriff's Department, was livid about the prosecutor's decision to drop the charges. This is a miscarriage, miscarriage of justice. The case against him, since it was filed nine months ago, has not changed, Begley said. I'm not going to give up. I'm not done. I'm going to speak justice for my dad, Fred, and Patricia. Hughes, an ex-Army Ranger and former security director at the Cabazon Casino and Tribe's Bingo Operations, was charged in October with the crimes, dubbed the Octopus Murders, because the tentacles of complex conspiracy spread worldwide, unquote. Now, right away, I should say that this piece reinforces a lie told back in news articles in the 1980s when people thought Jimmy Hughes was a security director, which he wasn't. He was just a security officer. This is this is the guy, LA Times. Is this guy still around? As far as I know. Yeah. Okay. I mean, and I haven't looked at it. It's present day. 
Yeah. Yeah. And this this woman, Begley, man, she has some balls. I would say so. Wow. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'm I'm with you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> All right. Oh, we're almost done with this one case, by the way. <laughs> one. There's two cases today, guys. <laughs> two murders. I mean, two deaths or two different whatever. You know what I mean? Two events. Here. <clears throat> two events. There you go. That's better. Uh, this like four deaths, so, but one and one. Yeah. It's so crazy. Okay. I know. Now you okay. see where I was going through. Um, I have two more loose ends here to tie. Two bombs, maybe. The Desert Sun reported something very interesting in December 2017. Oh, you're going to love this. This is just, oh, so this is recent. Yeah, this is recent. Oh my God, you're going to love this. This is why I feel like I have more information. This is all past 10 stuff. This is the most recent I get. 59 year old Russell Huber of Oroville, California was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for killing a man named Clyde Gregory Hayward on July 6, 1992. Hayward was from Desert Palm, a resort city from Coachella Valley, and was supposed to, was supposed to meet his girlfriend for a date on July 2nd. His pickup truck was found two weeks later on Highway 95 with dried blood and two 380 shell casings found about 100 yards from the vehicle. The victim's remains were found in a stream bed in Clark County, Nevada in February 1993. That's a long time but weren't positively identified until May 20th, 2014. DNA analysis, I know, <laughs> sorry. DNA analysis and meticulous forensic work found Russell Huber in front of a jury, which only took three hours of del deliberations to arrive at a guilty verdict. Quote, Hayward's girlfriend, whose name was not disclosed, told detectives at the time that she had turned down a marriage proposal from her employer, John Nichols, and believed he was behind her boyfriend's disappearance, but there was no concrete evidence. Oh. The prosecution alleged that after being rejected by the victim's girlfriend, Nichols arranged a fake business meeting with Hayward under the guise of securing golf carts for a development project. Hayward, a golf mechanic who previously had worked for a golf cart distributor, was killed after he showed up to meet with Huber and Peter Boncourt a longtime associate of the defendant, according to the district attorney's office, unquote. Russell Huber and this Peter Boncor met in prison in the 80s. As I said before, this Nichols family, especially John Philip Nichols, got shit done. So, so what happened to the Nichols? I mentioned how his wife, Joanne, worked in the offices of Cabazon Mission Tribe. She was pretty true blue and died working for them of natural causes. John Paul Nichols, the son, is simply retired now. John Philip Nichols, I also mentioned, died in 2001. I believe it was heart failure. What's interesting is what happened on July of 1985. John Philip Nichols pleaded no contest to two counts of solicitation to commit murder receiving a four-year sentence. This murder-for-hire scheme went awry because Nichols met with the two supposed hitmen who turned out to be police informants. Yeah. yeah. The two intended victims were residents of Indio, California. I have no names for the would-be victims, by the way. Nichols was 60 at the time, and due to ongoing health issues and the fact that no one was harmed, it lessened the prison time. No motives were mentioned by police when they arrested Nichols for the murder solicitations, but they believed it was drug-related. This drug angle might have originated from Nichols itself because he was placed in protective custody in Chino for it and was placed near the infirmary for health reasons. So they were protecting him for something. Or he was protecting himself in advance from prison, from yeah, the general he could, population. He couldn't something. be right. Exactly. So what do you think of this? These two things. Meaning, what do you mean? Um, well, okay, I'm tr I'm trying to say it while saying it, although I'm going to say it now. This motherfucker had Alvarez killed, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we it kind of sounds that way. I mean, we find another headman, hitman, who brought another hitman along. This Boncor guy, after all this, after so many years in 2017, right? They find out that these two men in prison. 
And this guy, the, the victim's girlfriend, dated or maybe was being sought after by this Nichols senior guy. Makes it kind of connects too easily that these two headmen could have been the original killers hired by Nichols back then in eighty one. Well, you got to have a, a or relationship somewhere, there, or just I would in general, assume. or just in general for other things. You know, if they killed this one guy in the eighties, right? Yeah, he's worked for me before. Let's do mm-hmm. it again. Or 85. they've worked for me before. Let's do it again. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Not nice people. No. Not nice people. No. No, no, no. I think that out of the many lessons and takeaways the story brings, one that must not be forgotten is that some truths never stay buried and that sometimes the conspiracy nuts are proven correct or as correct as history will allow us. As promised, here's the TikTok video of Rachel Begley's daughter. Tell me a conspiracy that sounds crazy, but is true. I'll start. The octopus murders. What's that? Well, in 1981, a Cabazon Indian tribal leader named Fred Alvarez, a Hells Angel named Ralph Boger, and their friend Patricia Castro were murdered. In 1991, there was a reporter named Danny Casalero. He was looking into the murders of those three. He even started saying he probably had a break in the case, and it could implicate people in the U.S. Justice Department. So naturally, a few days after saying that, they found him dead of apparent suicide. Twelve slashes on his wrist, one deep enough to sever a tendon. In 2007, the Hells Angels' daughter, she got a little curious and started looking into it too. And she got threats, but she also got enough evidence to actually bring somebody to trial. A trial that got dropped because of undisclosed new information. Why do I know all this? Ralph Boger's my grandpa, and my mom was the one getting threatened. Now. I realize that there's still a lot of information left unexplained on the table, plus the teases of out of left field keywords like the Reagan administration and the fucking Yakuza. I still have another death to cover before we end tonight's show. At Death Wish Princess talks briefly about a journalist that was found dead after looking into the triple murders in 1981 and that he had found some key information. The circumstances around his apparent suicide the book he was working on, and the sources he was amassing is what makes this story too big for one show. Part two will cover the big and small players that I simply could not get into today, which is why this next segment will interest you, but also leave you wanting more. Let's get into it. Whatever the number of sources and publications that talks about the 1981 triple murders, there's at least double that amount for this journalist. His name was Joseph Daniel Casalero. Everyone called him Danny or Daniel. And for this segment, amongst the articles written in the 90s and 2000s, I will use two opposing books as sources. One is called When Fiction Becomes Fact, The Death of Danny Casalero from June of this year. This came out this year. Second book is titled The Octopus, Secret Government and the Death of Danny Casalero from 96. And it's easy to tell which book believes in the conspiracy and which doesn't by the titles alone. All right. Background on Danny Castellaro goes like this. Born in 1947, Danny came from a big Italian-American Catholic family in McLean, Virginia. McLean rests in northern Virginia in Fairfax County and is home to people from the military, diplomats, and government official, officials due to its close proximity to Washington, D.C., the Castelleros are not connected to D.C. in any way. But since Danny's father was a doctor, the family was stable but not rich. You know, like rich light, maybe. Rich light. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know why I say those things. Danny was, was seen as gregarious, a womanizer, and enjoyed a drink in his hand. Mm. It's safe to say that he frequented the bars of any town he visited. He married a former Miss Virginia named Terrell Pace, and they had a son together named Trey. After 10 years, they divorced, and and Danny was granted legal custody over Trey. His career has peaks and valleys, but nothing long-lasting or stable. He freelanced as a journalist for different publications here and there, usually political and world news pieces. But Danny also was an amateur boxer. He wrote poetry and short stories. 
and even wrote a novel titled The Ice King in 81, the year of our triple slings. <laughs> From the late 70s up to the end of the 80s, Danny Castellaro acquired a series of computer industry trade publications, which he sold. This last bit is useful because when he decided to take up journalism again in the early 90s, his entrance to this octopus conspiracy was of a computer software scandal with the U.S. Just, uh, with the U.S. Department of Justice. Very interesting there. Danny was in the middle of writing a book when he died. It was untitled, and most of the papers were held in his briefcase or an accordion file holder thing, you know, those things. It became almost like a characteristic, seeing Danny carrying his papers nearly everywhere with him. I'm not going to get into the details, but Danny was trying to find a publisher for his book. He needed the advance and or the resources that the backing of a publishing house could bring for him, but he was not successful. Three pitches, three meetings, and they turned him down. Everything that went into writing the book, travel, connections, paperwork, was self-funded. Sources do not say that the book led to his money troubles, but around the same time, Danny was talking to lawyers about needing to sell the house he lived or he'd lose it due to back taxes. Mm. In the past, Danny's support system, his family, did help him with loans, but the house problem was too big to solve at the time of his death. Now, in the days leading to his death, Danny's friends and family were interviewed <coughs> by a slew of people like local police, FBI, journalists, and others. There is a surprising amount of information of the days leading up to his death, the day of, and the weeks afterward. It is as meticulous of a character study as a big conspiracy legend like he, Lee Harvey Os Oswald. I said that weird. Lee Harvey Oswald. Okay. I'll give you guys some examples and highlights. I'm not going to tell you everything. Oh, that's another book entirely. Wow. Just on the day-to-day, -day, everyone. They mention wow. a lot of names. I'm not going to get into all of it. But I'll give you highlights and a little bit on each day. <laughs> on August 5th, 1991, Danny spoke to his brother, Anthony Casalaro, about not being able to get enough sleep lately because of phone calls he'd been getting in, in the middle of the night. This wasn't a new thing, though. Danny had been receiving these interruptive calls for three months prior to his death. Quote, Later that day, Anne Clank, a friend and journalist, saw Casalero's car parked outside Hunter's Bar in Oakton, Virginia. Clank went inside and saw Casalero, head slumped down, sitting at the bar. Casalero looked terrible. Casalero looked at Clank and said, in a tone of disgust, I just broke in slaw. Bill Hamilton's going to be real excited. Casalero then told Clank, you can have the story, and if you don't want it, you can give it to Jack Anderson. Clank had once worked as a reporter for syndicated columnist Jack Anderson. Casalero told Clank that he had got, just gotten back from West Virginia and that he was going back again. Clank was worried about Casalero. She said that his mood was not, was not one that one would expect of a journalist who had just broken a big story. She ordered a pizza for him, begged him to eat something, and left, unquote. Tuesday, August 6th, Danny called two journalists about the octopus book treatment he'd sent to them for discussion. Here, he mentions to his colleagues that he was leaving to meet an anonymous source that would make a pretty big dent in this conspiracy to Martinsburg, West Virginia. A neighbor named Olga Mokros, I don't know why I say it that way, Olga Mokros, was Danny's longtime housekeeper, and she helped him pack for his trip. Olga asked Danny if she should spare his, she should prepare, sorry, prepare his home for his son, Trey, who was due to visit in about two weeks. Danny Casalero told her that she would, that he, sorry, that he would not see Trey anymore. And then he led her to his basement, his basement office, I should say, and showed Olga where he kept his will. Wow. This was the last time she saw Danny. Olga told the village voice uh, this is after, obviously, that she answered several threatening calls that day. One of them, for example, was a man that said, this is a quote now, I will cut his body and throw it to the sharks. Shit. Mm -hmm. 
On Wednesday, August 7th, Casalero's close drinking buddy friend came to his house for a visit. He described Casalero's mood as exuberant and showed Mason papers in his basement office. Mason recalls seeing a photocopy of a passport of a young man named Ibrahim. This next bit is mildly, import mildly important, and the reason I'm bringing it up, and the reason I'm bringing up this photocopy. Quote, on August 29th, 1991, weeks after Danny's death, and on September 27th, 1991, the Martinsburg police received copies of a passport photo of an Arab named Hassan Ali Ibrahim Ali. This may have been the same photograph that Casalero had shown to Ben Mason in his basement office on Wednesday, August 7th. There is no evidence that Casalero ever met Ibrahim or that Ibrahim, whoever he is, had anything to do with Casalero's death. Unquote. It's odd. But Very I wanted odd. to mention that connection because his friend saw a photocopy of a passport. It said Ibrahim looked Arab. Cut to this time later, he recognizes it, you know, or it's recognized. Yeah. Yeah. And that's such a personal document uh, mm -hmm. yeah, for someone exactly. to have a, a copy of. In his of. basement, yeah. yeah. Very weird. I don't have much on that right now, but it's odd. On Thursday, August 8th, Casalero drove to Martinsburg, West Virginia, and checked into the Cher Sheraton Inn just off of Interstate 81. Check-in was between noon and 1 o'clock in the afternoon. He mentioned to the desk clerk that he was late for a meeting, so he'd have to open his room later, which is room 517. And the clerk did notice Danny carrying a beat-up black or brown briefcase. He wasn't sure. Danny headed to the bar at the Stone Crab Inn and mentions to the bartender, Tom Hatches, whom he recognized the year previous working at the Sheraton Inn, that he's waiting to meet some Arabs. No one came. So at about 1.30, Danny asked for some change and went outside where a payphone was stationed, but no one saw or heard the call. From here, he goes to Pizza Hut and drinks considerably more than his food portions, which was a small pizza. Leaving at 4 p.m., Casalero then heads to Hartsfield's Lounge and the bartender recalls his, his order starting off as bottled beer, but switching to draft because it was cheaper. They should tell you a lot about his drinking. That's three different places he's drinking. Yeah, by the way. in the afternoon. Back to, right, just saying, motherfucker drinks. Quote, Hittrick, the bartender, did not see Casalara talking with anyone else that night. However, the barmaid, Kim Waters, told a different story. The police originally met her by chance when they went to the home of one of the Sheraton desk clerks to interview him three days after Casalero's death. She happened to be at, de at the desk clerk's home. The police showed her Casalero's photograph. She said she remembered seeing him at the bar but could not remember anything else. Later that day, she contacted the police saying she had not remembered that Casalero had arrived at the bar at about 5.10 p.m. and that he had sat at a table with another man whom she described as dark-skinned, like maybe Iranian or Arabian. Oh. Waters recalled that both men were drinking draft beer and that the Arabian man was drinking very fast and was very insistent that the barmaid serve him quickly. She claims to have served four beers each to Casalero and the other man. She said the other man paid for all the beers in cash. Three days later, Waters helped the police prepare a composite drawing of this Arabian person. No one has been able to determine who this person is, was, if indeed there was such a person. Unquote. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> okay. So plot's definitely thickening here. Like cornstarch on, on Sunday. I don't know. I got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to bake. I just realized I'm not going to bake. <laughs> cornstarch on Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay. That last part, if indeed there was such a person, is the bias of the author coming out against any actual conspiracy, like in play, but I digress. Does the meeting with the Middle Eastern fellow at Hearthfields, Heart, Heather, sorry, Heatherfields, I said Hearthfields, it's Heatherfields Lounge, be this Ibrahim or related to him in some way? I don't know. Friday, August 9th, is the last day Danny Kessler was seen alive. Danny told the front desk that he'd been staying an additional night. 
he wasn't originally going to stay an extra night. It was just supposed to be one night, but he asked mm. for another. Here's where I got to tease you guys with something juicy, but snatching it back right after. Danny Castellero had two prime sources, actually fountains of information for his Octopus book. One of them was a man named Bill Hamilton, who was involved neck deep with the Inslaw scandal and the promised software. And they had a strong friendship. Bill was worried for Danny on that Friday because it had been days since their last phone call, Monday to be exact, and they keep in touch nearly every day. It's kind of cute, actually. They used to play chess over the phone. No. Yeah. I love that. It's a real bromance there. Bill knew of the meeting, but not the person, but that it was related to the octopus and expected him back home earlier. Bill ended up calling Danny's ex and in turn would wait to hear back from Danny. Obviously, it never happened. From the afternoon, Castellaro's whereabouts are mostly known, drinking beer here, coffee or eating something there. At about 6 p.m., he placed a collect call to his mother's house saying that he might not make his niece's birthday party since he was still in Martinsburg. A little after midnight, Castellero walked across the street to the convenience store for some coffee and made conversation with the clerk and another witness before returning back to the hotel. The only times that are unaccounted for are between noon and 2 o'clock and 6 and 9 p.m., but he was most likely in the hotel room. That's what people say. That's kind of what I say, too, I guess. The next day, Saturday, August 10th, Castellero was supposed to check out at noon. So at, well, at around one o'clock, the maid assigned to the fifth floor went in, noticed the bathroom door hallway halfway open, saw blood, and called for help. Quote, Casalero's nude body was in the bathtub. The water was bloody. The water temperature was cold. The tub was about three to th half, was, was about half to three-fourths full. Casalero was sitting with his feet toward the faucet, he was leaning against the side of the tub. His head slumped over the side. His right arm was hanging over the side of the tub, and his right hand was lying flat on the floor. His left hand was submerged underwater, tucked beneath his left thigh. Both of Casalaro's wrists had cut wounds. The fingernails on the thumb, forefinger, and middle finger of his right hand appeared to have been chewed. Unquote. Danny's wrist had been deeply slashed, three or four on his right wrist and seven or eight on his left. Wow. Mm -hmm. Blood was splattered on the walls and the floor. Next to the bathtub rested the wrapper, wrapper from the razor blade and a half-empty bottle of a Portuguese white wine. An ashtray with three cigarette butts was on top of the toilet tank, as well as a pack of cigarettes. Among Danny's fingerprints, Another was found on the ashtray, and it, and it has not been identified to this day. Mm. Unfortunately, beyond speculation, I have nothing else on this ashtray. There were no signs of a struggle or forced entry to the bathroom or hotel room. The rooms adjacent and across room 517 were full as part of one party of people in town for a soccer game. They heard nothing unusual throughout the night, and they didn't leave their rooms till morning. His wallet and identification was found in the room. The police also found a large black tote bag, which contained an empty bottle of Vicodin pills, one box of hefty trash bags with two bags missing from the roll, an unopened second bottle of the same white wine, one corkscrew, and three packs of cigarettes. I should note here that the Vicodin, empty bo uh, bottle of Vicodin was the the last remnants of his um, subscription he had from a dental surgery he had the year previous. I see. Okay. They figured that out later. I didn't write that here. I don't know why. Lastly, a legal pad was found on the nightstand in, in room 517. A single page was torn from the pad and it read, <clears throat> To those who I love the most, please forgive me for the worst, for the worst possible thing I could have done. Most of all, I'm sorry to my son. I know deep down inside that God will let me in. Oh, man. 
that said. Yeah. Anything so you want we don't, to say? Yeah. Well, I mean, so if he killed himself, there's a couple reasons, I guess, right? One is, sounds like he was in sort of financial ruin, mm-hmm. um, which is very embarrassing for a, an adult male, right? Yeah. Definitely. Uh, it's a bad place to find yourself. Very embarrassing. Uh, two, you know, he was on to this octopus thing. Did someone kill him and staged the scene? Um, or threaten him, threaten his family, you know? To do whatever else. Kill himself, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then, of course, this um, this dark-skinned fellow, you know, we don't know who he is and what happened to him. Mm-hmm. The source, right? The source, yeah. There's, wow, there's a lot going on there. A lot going on here. You're right. Signs of suicide are apparent, and no one would think otherwise or anything else upon first hearing the details or walking into the bathroom, right? You'd think, this yeah. might be the best time to insert another clip. Have you heard of a show called Unsolved Mysteries? You know I have. I love it. Yeah? I've only seen a few episodes, by the way. It's a TV show that started in 1987 and had 11 seasons with different celebrity hosts, not unlike Twilight Zone. Unsolved Mysteries has had a resurgence lately when Netflix renewed it on their platform. The show focused on real cases of perplexing disappearances, shocking murders, and paranormal encounters. Kind of like SOS, the TV show, you know. Oh, one could only dream. One could only dream, right? Can you imagine being a TV show host? I don't think I could do it. My hair, forget it. Um, on, <laughs> the makeup, tone, no way. On March 10th, 1993, Unsolved Mysteries released their 24th episode of their fifth season. And one of the topics, the first one actually, was about Danny Casolaro. Let's hear a segment of it. It is edited for time and spoilers. Just a few days before Danny Casolaro died, he told friends that he was on the verge of breaking a huge story. Danny claimed to have proof that some officials in the U.S. Justice Department were corrupt. Many suspect that Danny's death was not a suicide. They believe that he was murdered because he was the man who knew too much. Pretty direct connections with some of the underworld crime figures, not only... Danny Casalero stepped into a world that he didn't belong in. Uh, The type of people that he became involved with um, lie just as a matter of of course. They lie, they cheat. There are people who have been involved in numerous murders, dealing drugs, dealing arms. And Danny Casalero thought he could find his way through this labyrinth by himself. And that was a mistake. They're the guys that I've been working with, my contacts, and they're calling me and saying, look, Danny, you're getting too close. You're going to get hurt. Back off. A week before he died, Danny told his brother, Tony, that he had been receiving death threats. I don't recognize their voices. I don't know where they're coming from. They're just saying, you are going to die. <laughs> I'll tell you this, though. When I go to Martinsburg, if something happens to me or if I should get hurt, don't believe it's an accident. Danny arrived in Martinsburg with all of his notes and documents two days before he died. He was scheduled to meet with several informants and complete his investigation. He believed one of these new contacts would deliver key evidence about the finances of the octopus. The day before he died, Danny met with William Turner. He was a former employee of a major defense contractor. You have some documentation? You have some for me? According to Turner, he gave Danny papers showing the corruption that Danny believed was tied to the octopus. But within 24 hours, Danny Casalero was dead. There was no sign of Turner's documents or Danny's research papers. To this day, not one of those papers has been found. The media was all over the story. West Virginia authorities opened the formal investigation and ordered an autopsy. The assistant medical examiner for the state of West Virginia said, well, you know, he's already been embalmed and that's going to make it a little difficult. And I said, what are you talking about? He's already been embalmed. And he said, well, he was embalmed uh, apparently already. He said, you didn't know that? I said, absolutely not. I said, we didn't give any permission. I'm now going to cut the sutures to examine the wounds. The autopsy confirmed that Danny had bled to death from the 12 razor cuts. 
But more importantly, it revealed that Danny wasn't alone in his hotel room during his last moments. There was, on the actual autopsy report, described a bruise on the arm and a bruise on the head, which were never accounted for. I was told there were no signs of any struggle. Additionally, the tips of three fingernails were missing from one hand. When Danny's hotel room was cleaned the day after his death by a professional cleaning crew, important evidence was destroyed. One of the housekeepers saw two bloody towels in the bathroom minutes after Danny's body was found. It looked like they were used to wipe blood off the bathroom floor. The police reports of the investigation are certainly not professional. Fingerprints get lost, messed up. They drain the tub without a strainer. Sloppy work. Police have a rule in this country, and government people have a rule. When they screw up, they cover up. Sad but true. Do I think they covered up here? Yes, I do. Even Danny's funeral was clouded by mystery. At the funeral, a highly decorated military officer arrived in a limousine near the end of the service. No one recognized him. The man carefully placed a medal on the casket just before it was lowered into the ground. And we went back to Francis's house, Danny's mother's house, and I said, Francis, who was the military man? And she said, I thought you'd know. And we asked everyone there. There had to be 50 people at Francis' house. No one knew who they were. No one. Sorry if the editing was choppy, but I didn't want to spoil you guys on information that is way too dense, especially in a TV program. If you do watch the episode, just know that there's two layers deeper that I'll be sharing in part two. According to what I have, the embalming did occur before the family was notified. Martinsburg City paramedic David Brining was asked by Charles Brown, owner of Brown's funeral home, if the body could be embalmed. Brining did release, did release the body, and because the death was deemed to be a suicide, no autopsy was necessary. Two mistakes occur from this. The first is that Brown doesn't do a full job of embalming Danny's body, missing his bladder and liver. The second is that Brining should have made sure that the next of kin was notified first before releasing the body. Under West Virginia law, a deceased body may not be embalmed unless the authorities have first made due inquiry as to the desires of the next of kin. However, it was common practice for funeral homes in Martinsburg to do this when dealing with outsiders, people who didn't live there. This part was reported heavily and cited as a strange fact that supports conspiracy and murder. I cannot say for sure. People do make mistakes and all, but adding in the revolving evidence of what Danny knew and what we know, and it doesn't look good for, for just a suicide. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it certainly raises eyebrows, I would yes, say. Yes, yes, for sure. When I read that, I'm like, come on. Anyway. I mean, do they even make any attempt to contact Trey, for example, Danny's son? No, no, no. I'm about to get into a little bit of that, but no, they don't. Ugh. I mean, they, I mean, they do eventually, but not before the embalming is my point, you know. The Castellaro family weren't notified of, of Danny's death until August 11th. Martinsburg police say it was mis miscommunication within the officers, but again, who knows? Regardless, upon hearing the news, Anthony Casalero immediately asked Detective Swartwood, Swartwood, sorry, who was assigned to Casalero and placed the initial call to perform an autopsy immediately, that his brother had warned him that his life might be in danger. There are a couple of conflicting things in the Unsolved Mysteries clip, though. The first is that the paramedic, Brining, did find a bruise on Castellero's arm, but an injury, even a minor one, was not mentioned to the head, of the head. So the video says it was a head one, but not a, there wasn't a one in her, in her report. Mm. The video also talks about how a professional cleaning crew came the next day to rid the room of any evidence. That is not true, or at least rubs against with what I read, which is that the room was left undisturbed the rest of Saturday and all day Sunday. What is odd 
is that police did not officially seal the room before they left. The hotel manager left the room undisturbed. It was a civilian who kept the room undisturbed, not wow. the authorities. Mm -hmm. Now, the bloody towels in the bathroom is interesting. Officials said that Danny, in a drunken stupor or, and delirium from the loss of blood, saw the blood on the floor and wanted to clean it up, you know, to not make a mistake or a mess. Sorry. I guess it is possible, but logically, it could mean that someone was there or came afterward and cleaned the bloody footprint they made in the bathroom. With the other mistakes Martinsburg police made, it is just as likely that evidence of struggle or suspicious activities were found in room 517, but the trampling done by authorities caused them to cover it up to avoid shame and repercussion. Mm. There's a lot more to talk about, but we are nearing the end here. But what do you think of that so far? <sighs> Why would they leave the room unsealed? unsealed. Do they yeah. want someone to walk in there and, and screw the, screw the crime scene? Well, well, it's obvious that they thought it was a simple suicide. But still, I don't know how that works with I don't know how procedure works in that sense. But either way, they should probably keep away anyone that might come in. Right. It's still Absolutely. bloody and shed. Absolutely. Right. Uh, and then a bruise to the head. Yeah. So. Um, right. So the edit magic of editing. You didn't actually hear the clip. Uh, everyone else did. But in the clip in the Unsolved Mysteries, they say that um, two bruises were found on, on Danny's body that the brother was not aware of. You know, they only, he was only aware of the slashes to his wrist, right? But yeah. one bruise was on his arm, upper arm, and then the other supposedly his head. That's what the Unsolved Mysteries clip says. That is not true with what I read. The, the paramedic grinding found the bruise on the arm, sure, but not the head. So I I'm see. giving you the differences, like where they embellish something. Okay. At okay. least what I could find. The other one being the towels, maybe. Um, but I wanted to mention as much of the details as I can, at least the weird ones. <clears throat> And yet, yeah, use towels, clean up a bloody footprint. Right. That, that, that was, know, that was all my theory right there. But yeah, still, that could be that. Wow. Yeah. Where am I? Fuck. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> okay, here it is. Two more things that the clip talks about are Bill Turner and the military presence at Danny's funeral. The Bill Turner element is a cog in a bigger discussion. And I honestly don't know if he and Danny met on August 9th, 1991, as he said. Either way, his role in the octopus conspiracy is more than just a meeting. The fun thing about the military officer that no relative or friend of Danny's recognized is that I do not yet know what that's about. I'm still very much reading and discovering new things each day, but I'll try to get to the bottom of it. For and maybe, it, maybe just one of his sources or something. Mm -hmm. Could be, huh. but we don't know why he had a whole general-looking guy. You know, we don't know, we don't know anything about him so far. I don't yet. Yeah. yeah. One thing that I haven't mentioned, and this is uh, kind of important, and I'm surprised you haven't thought of it. Do you know what's missing in the hotel room? I don't. Keith. His, no, his work, his papers. Where's his briefcase? Oh, I mentioned everything that was found in the room. That was not one of them. Oh, shit. There you go. I was going to say what you'd say about that. So, Sorry, I'm sleeping on the job. Yeah, because you mentioned how mm -hmm. everyone always talked about how yep, that was, that like was a characteristic. A, yes. Yes. His beat up brown or black mm -hmm. briefcase, which was seen at the restaurants. Mm -hmm. Right? The yep. bartender seen it and everything. Yeah, and it's he gone would keep it in his room. car sometimes when he drank, but they searched his car and they found nothing. Nothing like that. Well, that says volumes right there. Mm -hmm. It's still missing, by the way. It's gone. Really? Mm -hmm. It's gone. It's connected to the octopus then. I mean, there's the evidence right there. Yeah. I really wanted to save it to the very end. I'm at the last paragraph here, but yeah. Wanted well, think his, his wallet was left there. Mm -hmm. His keys were there too. That's why they found the car. And like, everything looks fine in the car, but they didn't find no fucking briefcase. But the briefcase. Yeah. Wow. Well, well played. No accordion, no files, nothing. I like the way you set that up. Yeah. Well played. Thank you. I want to put that in there for sure. So that's a big, that's one of the big conspiracy holdouts. Like, hey, what about the fucking papers, you know? Anyway. In the meantime, know that I am supremely confident that even a veteran skeptic of conspiracies will, will raise their eyebrows when I'm done with all of this. 
The connections are too big to fail, easily researchable. What becomes complicated is discerning what is embellished and what isn't. What's complicated or too easy to connect. There is a lot of in interesting scraps of information left on the ground floor for this show that could almost double the word count. With that, keep in mind that the next show will define a generation of lying, backstabbing, and killing, and all in the name of money, power, and disbelief. Join us, won't you, for the Octopus Conspiracy. Otherwise, this thing will be a hot box. <laughs> do you have a do you have windows in that room? Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously the AC okay. is sticking out of a window, but uh, the window. Oh, it's a window unit. Oh, I'm surprised oh. I can't hear it. Right. That. Yeah. That's why I, I thought you thought I meant central air. No, no. It's yeah. Not central air. I mean, if I put this thing. Yeah, I don't think I could hear it. Oh yeah, then now I could hear a little bit. Well, yeah, because even the even at that point, it's just very faint. Oh, that's cool. I'm surprised. I'm. I'm happier. <laughs> I can keep it on. <laughs> oh, I'm drinking something from the past. From the past. So uh, you know, I told you I've been listening to our previous episodes. One of them, uh, we talked about how. Well, there was a there was a, a bit of episodes there in a row where I would come to your house. This is before COVID, obviously. Um, and we record there, and you would obviously serve me some drink. Mm -hmm. And one of them was UV Blue and Fanta. So guess what I got? No way. Mm hmm. That episode reminded me, so I wanted to restock last week or week before. Um, I got the UV blue <laughs> and a bunch of nice. Hot stuff. Yeah, and I've been drinking it here and there. Cool. I so, don't yeah. have any I don't have any UV blue. I have mm. to get some. Yeah. Gotta get some. Yeah, that that it's a Yeah, re listening to our episodes has really helped me out here <laughs> on some stuff. Cool. Like like what? I know some ideas that you were listing last time. Oh yeah, that that I mean that's I guess that's what I mean. The UV blue is probably like a weird example compared to others, but, but. all right, you want to do I assume both back to back. This one in Patreon. Yeah. Oof. Or do you want to? Or do you want to? Okay, well, do you want to see where we are after the main one? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Because we have until technically Wednesday. Mm hmm. Right for Patreon. Uh, mm, Tuesday. Tuesday. That's right. Because we're not releasing on the first of the next month. We're releasing no. at the end of this one. Yeah. So if anything, tomorrow, I don't know what you're up to. Uh, just, I mean, I, I'm off. <laughs> <laughs> how many, well, how many pages is this first episode here? Oh, 34. <laughs> oh, shit. Holy shit. If I <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't know if I'll be, it's already eleven almost eleven thirty. I don't know if I could do because tomorrow is a work day. <laughs> I do have beats also where like you might want to ask questions and shit or whatever. But um yeah, thirty-four and honestly Amazing. it might be the shortest one if I make two more parts. So I, I think I'm gonna break a hundred pages total. I was saying what? Might break a hundred pages. <laughs> You have no idea what there is out there. So what's the? Oh, that's something I'm going to have to mention. I'm going to have to work that in there somehow that this topic overall might break a hundred page script. Right. It might. Right. <sighs> okay. Like part two, again, I mean, I haven't just done this thing. I mean, I literally finished this part one last night and I think I'm going to have to like wing the very end a little. Cause I think I just wrote it. I was like 5 AM. This is 
Oh my god! Ago, Five a.m. But I thought like or six a.m. I don't remember anymore. I was like trying to like I need to go to sleep, but I can't wait till tomorrow because I'm recording right after work. So I'm like I'm writing it and I just put it's fucking ending whatever ends it and I'm like thinking during work like I should probably figure out a juicier ending there. <laughs> so <clears throat> all right, let's see let's see how this goes. Okay. All right, ready for the countdown? We got the vapors. All right, you're good. I went and I reached over to my mouse to like press stop because I've been recording with Roth lately. I'm like, wait, I'm not stopping this. Oh, no, <laughs> like, we're still rolling. Right. <laughs> I'm like, what the what am I doing? <laughs> Jesus, get a hold of yourself. Are you rusty um, too? At the, at the, doing the SOS show, yeah. <laughs> you know, one thing I realized about doing this, this particular octopus show um is that I'm really bad at reading. <laughs> it takes me oh. so long to read. <laughs> You mean read the script that you write, or read no, no, no? Books read sources. You... Read the sources. I yeah. see. I see. Also, fascinatingly, I what the right word? Um, I ne- You know, I always kind of like I tend to for all of our previous shows. I think almost it's not a hundred percent, nearly hundred percent of all of our previous shows that I've ever done research for. I always start with Wikipedia, and I go from there. You know, I find whatever they sourced, and then go from there, and then you go levels deep as you can. Yeah. This one. Opposite. I never even touched Wikipedia, only to find some background info on one town, like just really? basic info on the on a county and a town. Never even looked at the Wikipedia. That's how much shit I didn't need it. I didn't Damn, need it that's good. All. Yeah, that is wild, man. Didn't even need it. I, that blew my mind. Like two days ago, when I realized, I'm like, like that's true, shit. Because you're you're so right. I mean, usually ninety nine percent of the it's time, a great place I, to start. Yeah, it, it really is. It, it gets kind of the juices flowing. It gives you real good high level information. Yeah. And then, like you said, you branch out from there and go deeper and deeper. But mm-hmm. uh, to not have to do that, that's great. Mm-hmm. That's great. And I even realized you didn't have to do it. Yeah, because I started with the books. That's why. Probably. Is it OK? Is it OK for me to mention? Uh, you know, I'll come up with something to say, but what? the octopus murders. Yeah, that's what it's called. I mean, you know me, I have a whole intro that intros it, you know, you know, I'm just yeah. fucking dramatic about it. So uh, there's a little flair in the beginning, not much at the end, because like I said, I wrote it very fast at the end, of the night. <laughs> but uh, otherwise, yeah. I really, uh, I should try to hit, I had this whole theory in my head about this whole thought process in my head of like showing how, you know, these people ain't no angels, including Danny Kessler, or he had problems. So I hope I did a good job of portraying the. You know, he had problems and issues. It could be still be suicide. It could also very much not likely. It's like equal parts both. You know. Yeah. But yeah. um, I th- I mean, I think anyone would lean towards most likely conspiracy. I mean, I can. My theory, honestly, on this is that, honestly, is that he was threatened, convincingly threatened, either in person or through the phone, to commit suicide, to save his family, Jesus. save his probably his kid. Let's say, and um. And then someone came in, checked to make sure it was done, cleaned the footprint, took the papers, and left. Hundred percent. That's had to happen. That's what happened. That's very good. That's what I think happened. I think he really did commit suicide. Um, in the video, again, you haven't seen it. You haven't seen the unsolved mysteries yet. But um, in the video, they mention, and the other sources mention this too, that one of the cuts on his left wrist was uh, so deep that it cut a tendon. Oof. I didn't mention it, even though it's mentioned in other sources. One, because I forgot. But two, is because I, w- I don't think I would have mentioned it or I would have said it just to dismiss it because it's not said in the reports and in the, in the parameter starts report. The autopsy they did after the embalming, which led to nowhere because the embalming, guess what, can clear out all toxins of anything in there anyway. It fucks up the oh, autopsy. There's no man. results. The embalming fucked everything up. That's why I made sure I put it there because uh, the, the, the brother wanted... The autopsy, right? Immediately, but it was yeah. embalmed already. All the evidence is fucked up. What can you get out of it except for nothing. just all surface level shit? That's it. And nothing with the liver or nope. the no, nothing. Wow. Either. But it was common practice for West Virginia to yeah to do that with outsiders, strangers. Yeah. yeah. Oh man! But but they were but they weren't supposed to do that until next of kin was notified. They skipped that step. There was still a step they skipped. But it was still common practice to do so. To do that, yeah. Very weird. 
It is weird. Mm-hmm. Shit. 